Thank you, ladies. It's great to have the youth on the platform this morning. Amen. <clears throat> I'd like to encourage you to turn to Genesis. I know that's different than anything that you see on your outline and so on, but <clears throat> if you would, please, Genesis, just Genesis chapter 1, okay? I didn't want you digging trying to find it later. Okay, no, no humor on that one, huh? I mean, Genesis chapter 1, come on. Everyone can find that, right? Hey, you know what? A man was refused entry into a nightclub because he wasn't wearing a tie. And he remembered an old pair of broken jumper cables that he had in the trunk of his car. So he went to his car, tied the jumper cables around his collar, and headed back into the nightclub. The bouncer said, I told you that you need a tie to get in here. To which the man replied, you didn't specify what kind of tie. So the bouncer looked at him kind of weird and said, look, all right, I'm going to let you come on in, but don't try to start anything. Are any of you junk collectors? I mean, this guy had a pair of junk, <laughs> junker ca jumper cables in the back of his car. Uh, you know, I, I gotta tell you this story since I'm on this thing with the nightclub and everything. I, I hadn't planned to tell you this story, but I'm gonna tell you anyway. You know, occasionally we end up in the cabinet in there with uh, little cups and they just appear from anywhere. Don't know where always, they just appear. Um, I suppose maybe some from IP or some that somebody's had in their basement for years or who knows where all they come from, but they come and we're, you know, we're grateful for uh, the support there and, and uh, the donations. But at any rate, at the men's breakfast, we were eating breakfast uh, this Wednesday morning and we were sitting there drinking out of orange juice, out of some small cups. Each one of us had the same cup and... Um, and so it, it was advertising some kind of taco place. I'm not even sure what. One that I didn't recognize. But we were sitting there, and I happened to just read the bottom of the cup. And the cup said, if life deals you a bunch of lemons, it's margarita time. <laughs> That's what it said. So I said, let's get those cups out of here. Fortunately, there were only three or four small packs, and we got them out of here. Uh, but anyway, I just had to tell you that story. And, um, but, you know, let me just ask you, are any of you uh, junk collectors? Do any of you collect uh, junk? You don't have to raise your hand. That could be a rhetorical question. But our odds are that uh, in your garage or perhaps in a basement storage room, there are piles of tools or maybe furniture or lawn equipment that once uh, was sparkly and new and... Uh, but it's, it's now rusted or scratched, missing parts and knobs and handles. And it's on your list to fix one day. But you've got to find the right piece, or you've got to talk to someone who knows. Uh, but you just never get to it. And so it just sits there, and eventually, of course, it's time to get rid of it. And that's usually what happens to broken things. We purge them from our lives. They're, they're no longer of any use to us. Now this series is about seeing our lives as bread that Jesus takes in his hands. He blesses it. He breaks it and gives for the life of the world. And you find three such instances in the Gospel of Luke alone uh, and there are, of course, uh, other places in the New Testament where Jesus did just that. He took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and then he gave it. You know, bread, we learned last week, is kind of ordinary, uh, something common. Uh, we talked about how difficult it is to imagine our ordinary common lives actually being blessed, sacred and holy. And yet that is what happens to our story when we surrender to Jesus, when we accept Christ and we're baptized in him, we are blessed, we are sacred, and we are holy, set aside for the work of our Lord. And that is what holy means. 
that we are dedicated or consecrated, given over to the Lord's work. So to be blessed is to have our identity recovered, if you will. Uh, we were created to be a true child of God when we entered into this world, made in his image, as you well know. And that happens when we accept Jesus as Lord. To be blessed is to be restored. It's, it's to become what we were made to be, dedicated, consecrated, given over to the Lord's work to the glory of God. So that's what we're going to talk about this week. We're going to talk about uh, broken, the second word in our series, blessed, broken, given. Um, we use the word broken uh, in several ways. First, I think brokenness is a way to describe our own uh, frailty. And uh, you'll see that on, on, on the slide there if you're filling in the blanks on the outline. Uh, you know, this is the experience. Frailty is an experience of running up against our own uh, limitations. And of course, we know we are limited. We have a, a finiteness about our uh, self, our own weaknesses. Uh, but secondly, brokenness can also be uh, used to refer to our own failure, our own failure. When we come up short, when we miss the mark, when we fail, what is required of us in any given situation or relationship, and we come face to face with our brokenness. And quite often, plain and simply, it is sin. It's sin in our life. Now finally, brokenness is also a way of speaking about this fallen world that we live in. When sickness or death occurs, when tragedies happen, uh, we hear creation groan. Situations and circumstances that happen in our lives with seemingly no reason at all, other than the fact that we do live in a sinful fallen world. The creaking and the cracking of the world, uh, things coming apart from the seams, the pain and the sorrow, all signs of the brokenness of the world. And we are all affected at one time or another to one degree or another brokenness. You know, brokenness is what I want to talk about today. The brokenness of our frailty, the failure, and the fallen world uh, in which we live. You know, there's a children's poem generally ignored as kind of nonsense by adults. I know you're all familiar with it. Uh, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. You know, it's just a clever little rhyme, often animated with a funny egg figure perched on a wall. You've seen it in a number of different ways, I'm sure. But today I want us to stop and take a, a closer look. I'm often amazed at the profound meanings that come from children's books and children's nursery rhymes, rhymes just like this one. You know, perhaps the poem remains popular among children because it has a deeper meaning that we can all sense. In this silly little poem, we have portrayed our human condition and the futility of most efforts to fix the world in which we live, the futility of just trying to fix the world. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. You know, the first line says Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. This line is the beginning of the poem, but it also parallels the beginning. Now, I'm talking about the beginning of humankind because Genesis chapter 1, and, and if you'd like to turn there, as I've as suggested that you do, uh, Genesis chapter 1, uh, <clears throat> and also we're going to be jumping over in a little while to uh, Genesis chapter 3, so... Um, stay tuned. But in, in Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse 26, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. You see, God created humankind in his image as the very best of his creation. We are referred to in 
uh, the Psalms, one of the Psalms as being the very crown of God's creation. And, and so it was as if God made humankind and kind of set them up on a, on a wall, if you will. People were able to relate perfectly with God, to feel his nearness, to communicate personally with him. And God set humans high on the wall with God-likeness, wisdom, power, and, and knowledge. We were set up on a wall, the crown of God's creation. You know, the poem sets up the action with a simple statement. And perhaps it was a beautiful spring day with, with flowers blooming and birds chirping. And from his perch, Humpty declares that all is right with this world. Many can all identify with the peaceful tranquility from one time or another of Humpty as he set up on the wall. Life is like that sometimes. Sometimes it is peaceful and tranquil. Another analogy portrays God as a burning campfire at night. And all God's new creation are all joined hands in a grand circle around this light. And in this idyllic state, every person could see the light and everyone saw all their fellow humans with the light of God reflected in their faces. Do you have that picture? All in a circle, looking towards the middle of the circle. God is in the center, and all the faces are reflecting the light of God. And like Humpty perched on the wall, this original state perfectly reflected God's divine plan. But then something happened, and you know what it is. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall, but Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And now things are a mess. I mean, there's guilt, shame, death, dying, sorrow, pain, suffering, evil world that we live in. Some brought on by our weakness, our own sin, or maybe because we simply live in a sinful, fallen world. Brokenness, addiction, a broken relationship, the loss of a loved one, and perhaps in your life, you can look back to a better time. Can you remember back in, 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 in such an idyllic time in your life? How far back do you have to go to recover the innocence of youth? Back before your fall? Back before you made a mess of life? Back when relationships were right? I mean, after the fall, we look back with envy at the simple times of just sitting on the wall. And in our poem, in creation, in our relationships, something happened in our lives. In the poem, in creation, in our relationships, in all three, we can describe it as the fall. And so the poem gives us no clue to the cause of Humpty's fall. No clue. Maybe the wall was slippery. Maybe he became distracted or, or just tried to reach too far. I mean, he didn't really have too stable of a body, you know. In the poem, the fall is a mystery. But you know what? It's not in creation. It's not a mystery. Not, not for us. The Bible says that humans tried to reach higher than they were meant to reach. And, and we can picture Adam and Eve on their tiptoes reaching just beyond their grasp. And God said they were not to eat of the fruit. But they wanted to be like God. And so just a little further, the snake said this fruit would be good. This is good. And so when the first man tried to reach that which he was not supposed to reach, he fell. And great was the fall. Great was the fall. You know, in Genesis chapter 3, I told you we'd be there if you want to follow along with me. I'd like to look at verses 1 through 6, if you would. 
Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. Maybe the serpent hadn't heard anything about spiritual death. For God does know that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. I think God can handle it, and I'm not so sure we can. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. You see this fall, the fall of Adam and Eve represents the entry point of sin and failure into creation. And, and all of us have fallen as well. Our fall has to do with more than just the Garden of Eden past. Why? Because the fall is not something just in the past. It is something very much present right now. It is personal for each one of us. For each of us comes to a point when we want that which will be harmful to us. We stop listening to God and let the snake tell us what to do. We change our loyalty from the creator to the creature and we reach for that forbidden fruit. You know, the Bible warns us in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 8, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. In 1 Corinthians 10, 12, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. Now, in the analogy of the campfire that we talked about just a moment ago, where everyone was gathered in a pleasant circle, holding hands, facing the light of God, suddenly one, then another, turns their back on the light, faces the darkness, and begins to move away from God. And before you know it, all of the creatures are wandering in the darkness far from God. And now instead of seeing others reflecting the light of God on their faces, we see the, what you might call the shadow side of life. The dark shadows loom before us and bring fear and alienation We're groping in the darkness, trying to find our way, lost and afraid. One false step and suddenly we find our lives tumbling out of control. We never intended to turn that way. We only turned away from the light just for a moment, just for a moment, just for a taste. We just stretched out for one enticing bit of fruit. But suddenly the consequences of our sin are far greater than we expected. That's what sin does, you know. Suddenly we all lie like Humpty at the bottom of the wall and we're broken and we're shattered and we're fragmented. We lie there knowing that unless something drastic happens, our fall will be fatal. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Fatal? All the king's horses and all the king's men could not put Humpty together again. Well, suddenly, and much to our relief perhaps, at least we think, here comes the king's men and and their horses to put us back together again. But who are these men? 
and who is their king? The poem once again leaves us in the dark. We have no idea who these king's men are, but we see them picking up the broken pieces of eggshell Humpty, trying to fit them together. Perhaps they attempt to glue the pieces back together. Perhaps they have a little bit of tape. But the poem makes it clear that there was no fixing what was broken. The king's men failed. They could not put Humpty together again. But we've had our experience with King's men as well. I'm sure most of us. Perhaps today we would call these failed efforts by names like psychologists, perhaps, psychiatrists, self-help gurus. Not that they're all bad, but there are different experiences Some maybe look to movie stars or uh, a TV preacher. The newest shiny thing, whatever might be out there. And maybe these king's men are are self-help books. Maybe the king's men are considerate bartenders who listen to you as you cry in your beer. Many have tried new age religion or felt that quartz crystals would put us back together. And many of these are only band-aids feebly attempting to heal our brokenness. And in the end, we have concluded that the children's poem is exactly right. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. To what do we compare this part of the children's poem when we consider our spiritual life? Well, just a few examples I would suggest that the king's men could represent the misunderstandings of the Bible that people always use as an excuse for not wanting to be involved. Putting religion before relationship with God through Christ. Maybe it's the thought that the Ten Commandments are more than a tool to point us to the inability to save our own lives or to even obey the laws. Obey all the laws and we're going to go to heaven though. I mean, you know, but who can do that? Show of hands, another rhetorical question. The problem with the law was that it worked on the outside of us. It tried to patch us up, bandage us together, apply a little first aid cream and maybe a piece of tape. God had a purpose for the law, again, pointing us into the direction of our own inability to save ourselves by living a perfect life. Romans chapter 8, verse 3, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh... Well, it taught good morals and good ethics, no doubt. And as we obey them, that's a great thing. But God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. That's what Paul said to the church at Rome. And in Galatians, Paul's letter to the church of Galatia, in chapter 2, verse 16, know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we, too, have put our faith in Christ, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But let me tell you what you want to hear. From Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15, by setting aside his flesh, the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. God was bringing the Jews and the Gentiles together to make peace through Jesus Christ. So at just the right time, we're told, in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, 
It actually says when the time fully come or in the fullness of time in some translations, and it was according to God's plan, God sent his son, the king, could do what all the king's men could not do. He could do all that the king's men could not do. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses, beginning in verse 18, the scripture says, All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So we're reconciled with God so that we can go and give the message of reconciliation to other people, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed us to us the message of reconciliation. That's what he's given us to do. And Paul goes on to write, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. So in verses 20 and 21, the Apostle Paul says, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So we live by the righteousness of God. Not really by our own righteousness. We strive for it, but it's the righteousness of God that makes us right with God, justified. Jesus the Christ is the only one who can put humankind back together again. That's good news. That is good news. He does it by making a new creation. The king of kings does what all the king's men cannot do. The king's men were of the world. They cannot put us together again because they did not make us at the very beginning to start with. Only the one who made us in the beginning can put us back together again. And that is what the gospel is all about. The solution to our brokenness does not come when we are reformed does not come when we are rehabilitated or re-educated. It only comes when we are recreated and transformed. And as we've said in the last few weeks, our lives are restoried, restoried. And it's only then it will not do to turn over a new leaf. We must begin a new life under a new master. Christ Jesus. We must be born again. It's a new start. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed. Behold, all things have become new. So when we trust Christ, we are no longer God's enemies or strangers or foreigners to him. We have been reconciled to God. We have been brought from wandering in the darkness back to the light of God. And when we are reconciled to God and humankind, we once again enjoy the campfire glow and the warmth of the right relationships. I'm going to ask the praise team if they begin to make their way forward. We may try to wrap things up just a little early here and have an extra time for an extra donut. You know, there's a final part of the story in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, and I've already mentioned it, but we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We are appointed to be king's men, not ambassadors of those false kings of the world who failed to put Humpty back together again but we are ambassadors of Christ, taking the message of Christ to the rest of the world. We do not have the power to put people back together again, but we know the right king. We know the one who can. And our job is to go into the darkness 
and find people headed in the wrong direction, point them to Christ, not to ourselves. God is still in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. And Christ is still in the business of picking up the pieces of broken men and women and making them whole again. You know, Luke chapter 22, verse 19, and he took bread, he blessed it and broke it, and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. You know, in Luke chapter 22, a little further along in the chapter, that took place, as you well know, in the upper room as Christ was explaining to his disciples, look, I'm getting ready to go away. This body given for you, do this in remembrance of me. Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 42. Father, if you are willing, Jesus said, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, I just want you to hear of the suffering that Jesus was going through as he looked toward the cross. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. It was not Jesus Christ who broke us. He broke the bread to say this, I believe. I understand your suffering. Now one thing about it, Jesus did not have to die to understand our suffering with or without the cross. He, he understood. He understood. But he suffered and died for us so that we would understand just how much he understands and how much he loves us. And he died for our sake. God doesn't make junk. We do. Your life can be different beginning today. Live your life knowing that you are blessed and broken and open to the working of God in your life through Jesus Christ. Begin living the new story. You know, we might finish the good beginning of the nursery rhyme this way. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Then the real king came to his aid, brought reconciliation, not a Band-Aid. Jesus brought new birth and a new creation, make Humpty Dumpty whole and brought jubilation, placed Humpty Dumpty back on the wall, and then he gave to Humpty a brand new call. Ambassador of Christ is his new name introducing others to the healer of the broken is now his game. If you find yourself broken at the foot of the wall, to the King of Kings, you should give a call. And just like Humpty of old, Christ will come and make you whole. We're gonna do, sing our invitation to him and I wanna encourage you to come and accept Jesus as Lord. Come and be baptized into him and begin a restored life in him. Won't you come as we stand together and sing our invitation?